large creatures may be prowling the mountains of California. Two creatures I saw could not have been more than a yard apart, and they were definitely there together. Elusive. These beasts are easily spooked. And they start thrashing and screaming and throwing rocks at you. Strange tracks may indicate a breeding population. So this is about three days old footprint right there. New evidence is coming to light. So you can see the subject moving from right to left. Now Monster Quest takes up the search, looking for evidence of the Sierra Sasquatch. I'm starting to hear something. Oh, this is pretty weird. Jaime, do you read me? People around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. The Sierra Nevada. This 400 mile mountain range straddles the border of California and Nevada. The area is filled with wildlife, including the bighorn sheep and black bear. But lurking in this alpine wilderness may be a family of beasts that strikes fear in all who encounter it. It was at least uh, seven foot tall as it stood up. Very lean, very muscular. These were big things. These were big beings. Whatever it was, it traveled quite a long distance. I do think they're walking together as a group or a family unit. Eyewitnesses describe seeing giant hairy beasts that roam the Sierras in family groups. They range from seven to nine feet tall and are thought to weigh anywhere from 500 to 800 pounds. The animal's hair is dark black in the younger animals to brown in adults. All of the creatures have piercing red eyes and are known as Sasquatch. The one thing I can't get out of my mind was the night we were on patrol and we were waiting to be ambushed. Butch Young was only 19 when he was sent to the Marine Mountain Warfare Training Center near Mono Lake, California. They sent us there to learn how to fight, how to conduct combat, how to uh, survive and make war and meet the enemy head on in a mountainous environment. Young thought he was prepared for the remote wilderness location. The training center was extremely remote. At night, you would hear absolutely nothing. There was no sound of cars. There was no planes really going over it. One night, Young and his squad were on patrol during a nighttime war game. It was cold, and we were probably around seven, 8,000 feet. There was snow on the ground. The moon was out, and you could see quite clearly. The men spotted what they thought was an opposing squad. As I looked off to my right, moving through was two figures in the trees. One of them was standing. The other one was kind of crouched. But the pair did not act like Marines on maneuvers. They were defying all logic about how a Marine should be in the woods trying to cover and conceal himself. It just didn't make any sense. Confused the squad strained to get a better look. And I was looking for any sign that this might be Marines. I was looking for a weapon. I was looking for the edges of uniforms. I just remember the moon being able to light them up just enough to where I could see the one's fingers. To be able to distinguish that from 25 to 35 yards away, that had to be a pretty big hand. It wasn't until later that the Marines realized what they'd seen. The next morning, we found out that the aggressor squad was two clicks away. They weren't even in the neighborhood. They were nowhere near us. So we were wondering what we saw, who was up there in the tree line. Well, maybe it was a Bigfoot. Maybe we actually saw a Bigfoot. The Sierra Nevada region has long been the location of Sasquatch sightings and dozens of strange tracks have been found here. But there are some who are unconvinced that the area is inhabited by a Sasquatch family. I'm skeptical about them being Sasquatch because we don't have any definitive signs in the tracks that would separate them from human tracks. John Mianzinski is a wildlife biologist. He believes that the tracks were made by a known animal. 
it's possible that these are young Sasquatch. But I would think that young Sasquatch would avoid people just like uh, old Sasquatch do. The sightings have persisted near Mono Lake, located 185 miles east of San Francisco. Monster Quest will start its search for the legendary creature here. They will search the area using infrared aerial and ground surveillance cameras. The science team will analyze video thought to be a Sasquatch. Finally, they'll examine the evidence that families of Sasquatch live here. Anthropologist Dr. Jeff Meldrum will lead the expedition. He'll be guided by Jaime Avalos, who has tracked Sasquatch in the area for years. The fact that Jaime has found multiple individuals in concert of different sizes, but of a moderate uh, foot length, is really quite intriguing. By far, the majority of reports of sightings, as well as footprint discoveries, involve a single individual. I'm finding them going into the same areas about the same time of the year for about the past two years. So I can go to an area at a certain time and find tracks in these areas now that I've established a corridor of movement. Avalos believes a family of Sasquatch is traveling together because of the varying size of prints he has found. I've pulled up some that are 11 inches, 10 inches, and 8 inches. Younger juveniles, most likely based on the size of the, of the tracks. The team's plan is to examine the existing evidence, including the footprint casts, assess whether the habitat of the area could support a large primate, and then attempt to track down the creatures. Well, did you guys have a good trip? Yes, we did, sir. How are you? Fernando. Roger, Fernando. So. Fernando, nice to meet you. You're the tracker. Yes, sir, I am. I want to get my cuff out of here and we'll tape this on. This is the thermal imaging camera. We're going to mount it on the wing. The team believes that the Sasquatch can easily be frightened by noise, so they've decided to use a glider to survey the area. The thermal camera on the wing will pick up the heat signatures of animals moving below. The aircraft has a small engine that is used to climb to gliding altitude, then shuts off, and the glider soars in total silence, undetected from the ground. Yeah. All right, you guys, we'll finish with this uh, cuff. Our camera's all set. We got, I'm gonna make a pass at 500 feet, see what your thermal image looks like. And then I'm gonna do one at 1,000 feet, one 1,500 feet, and maybe get some sound readings about how loud I am so that we get an idea of what uh, the Sasquatch would would hear, and I'm gonna fire this thing up, so we probably should have you clear out here. The test flight will enable them to calibrate the thermal camera. Clear prop. Okay, we've got full power. Levine traffic, uh, experimental to Tango Tango. We're doing some sound tests. I'll be turning a right face, making a 500 foot flow pass over Levine. I'm gonna make a pass at about 1,000 feet over the runway. I'm gonna continue and make my next pass at 1,500 feet above the runway. For the third pass, the engine is turned off to begin gliding. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and go into my stealth mode. I'm gonna be shutting my prop down. Uh, we're gonna do that right now. Levine traffic to Tango Tango. I should be over the numbers 1-5 right now at 1,500 feet above the ground. At this altitude, it is impossible to see or hear the glider from the ground. Perfect for stealth surveillance. But the high winds are causing problems. I think we've lost our tape. A cable has ripped loose, ruining the thermal image of the ground. We're getting a fair amount of turbulence here. I'm going to go ahead and just take it in. The pilot decides to land. I'm on about a 10 mile final approach for 3 3 B binding, and we've got some tape coming loose.
Monster Quest is searching the mountains of California for the Sierra Sasquatch, a beast that may live in groups or families. The earliest sightings in this area are part of Native American legend. The Shoshone tell of the Jarbidge, a giant hairy man-eater. The Jarbidge, or hairy devil, was thought to prey on those who wandered away from the tribe. It was said to carry off its victims, leaving only large footprints behind. Drawings of these prints, mixed in with those of other native animals, may be found on the rocks of the Sierra Nevada. The presence of of footprints as represented by any hunter-gatherer society represents their familiarity with the animal life that is present in, the, in, their, in their world. The shape and placement are significant in identifying the Sasquatch prints in the carvings. The representation of uh, five-toed plantigrade, that is flat-footed footprints, which are quite distinct from the typical representation of a human foot. This uh, one foot placed in directly in front of the other is interesting, and they do stand out from all the other more familiar wildlife tracks that are represented so often in these petroglyphs. And now, new evidence has come to light, which may show the Sasquatch. And when I saw it on there, I was like stunned. The hair literally went up on the back of my neck. The man who shot this video is concerned about his family's privacy and has asked Monster Quest to obscure his identity. We just took a day trip out to Monowit just to see the lake and just, you know, catch the sights. So we drove out and parked the car and took a walk down to the lake. I had my home video camera with me. I was basically shooting the scenery around the lake, shooting the tufa, shooting the lake, shooting my family. But something was lurking nearby. The rock formations are really pretty spectacular. And then Sierra Nevada mountains on one side, and then the White Mountain Range on the other side. That area was just spectacular. It's beautiful. Here we are at Mono Lake on Saturday morning, first day of our vacation. I was shooting the panorama, basically. I was not out looking for anything. It was really cold, and it was really windy, and we just uh, ended up packing it up about a, probably about an hour later and went home. The tape was forgotten for 17 years, until one day when a family member played it and noticed something out of the ordinary. The hair literally went back up on the back of my neck. Here was this thing that was down there, some kind of creature that was down right where my kids were, right on the beach right there. And so it was a little bit unnerving. If I would have turned it off a second or two sooner, I probably never would have caught it. Uh, to me, it's still inconclusive. It's a mystery to me. I don't, I don't think it's a bear. I don't think it's a person. I don't know. The science team will analyze the video. Forensic analyst Greg Stutchman has traveled to Mono Lake, where the recording was made. He will collect data to determine the size of the creature. The video was recorded in 1991. Since the footage was shot, the water level has risen seven feet, partially submerging the rock formations seen in the original video. The team is forced to search the 16 miles of coastline for the filming location a panoramic image created from multiple frames of the video will help locate the site. Hey, Steve, come on over. I think I may have found it. Hey, what'd you find? They use the mountains in the background as a reference point. Let's get our measuring equipment and do the complete photogrammetry analysis. To calculate the height of the creature in the video, they must determine the dimensions of the rock formations. Okay. The first step is to photograph them using known focal lengths. Hold it right there again. Put this right up to it. Then they measure the distance of the camera to the waterline and the vertical height of the waterline to the center of the camera's lens. 87 inches. Okay, that's it. Okay. 
The last step is to use a laser measuring device to determine the distance from the camera to the rock formation. The science team now has the data they need to begin the analysis back at their lab. Jaime Avalos believes that the tracks he has documented around Mono Lake were made by the creature. He has traveled to an area near the sighting location. He'll be installing a PIX controller surveillance camera developed for law enforcement agencies to monitor large areas. Avalos believes the creatures are familiar with him, so he hikes in alone to set up the camera. I think the creature might be comfortable with me just because of the approach that I'm taking. It's a respectful observation. He finds fresh deer scat just below the snow line. This is the elevation where he suspects the Sasquatch may be hunting. Avalo soon finds a good place to deploy the camera. The system has wireless motion sensors and can be buried, making it virtually invisible. Jaime sets up the camera, motion sensors, and infrared light source, then buries the recorder. Okay. The team prepares to carry out its aerial search. This is the airport right here. This is the canyon that I'm talking about. There's been previous activity before, and this is actually an area of projection. You're not going to have a big area that you're going to have to look at. Once we start the thermal cameras, they'll just I'll, I'll cover the whole area. We can also come down this way and then come towards the Chew Lake area. The tip of this lake, I'm going to put my spoilers out and I'm going to just circle around and drop several thousand feet to the lake level. If I see something, I'll probably swing out here a ways, climb way back up several thousand feet. And they won't even be aware of me at all. Let's go ahead and do this. All right, oh, let's go. Both tanks, we've actually got uh, 18 gallons of gas. That's six or seven hours of flight. The rest of the team follows the glider from the ground. Two Tango Tango, can you please advise on your current position? We're going to head on down to June Lake, and we'll have our search cameras out going all the distance. Roger that. The throttle back now. Kind of just go into a gliding mode here. Suddenly, the camera detects a heat source. We're picking up a little hot spot here just south of the, the little lake there. Okay, we'll go on up and take a look on the, on the ground. The heat signature is near June Lake, one of the areas they have targeted. The ground team arrives where the hot spot appeared and searches for evidence of the beast. There has been a lot of deer came in through this area to drink water in and out. This is where the predators hang out because Definitely. they know they're going to come down and they're going to have to get a drink of water. Look at this one. This is actually a bear. This is a big bear. Yeah, okay. he is. This area has been teeming with animals that could be prey for the Sasquatch. Also, we have a raccoon and we also have a deer and also one a, a duck. So you have a lot of animal activity up here, this area, in and out, in and out come over here and drink water right there. The animal activity is encouraging, but a storm is approaching. OK, what do we have here? It's like the 11 by 5 again. The fresh track has the same dimensions as those found by Avalos in the past. Water's starting to come up, so we're going to have to do this sure. quick. They need to make a cast before the storm washes away the tracks. This wind is just really blowing me around. OK. Excellent. They'll need to analyze the print. There could be further proof. So I'm just going to let it fill in itself. We'll give it a second here.
Monster Quest has traveled to the Sierra Nevada mountains, where a family of Sasquatch may be preying on the local wildlife population. It could have ripped my door off, and there wouldn't have been a thing I could have done about it. Jaime Avalos was driving in the mountains 30 miles southwest of Mono Lake when he saw something shocking. When I had come down this hill, I had seen this creature cross the road. I really wasn't sure what it was. The first thing that came to my mind was, you know, what the heck is a guy in a gorilla suit doing up at this elevation? I started pulling up forward again. And then it came back. As the sun shined onto it, I could see the changes of the muscles moving underneath of the fur. Avalos estimated the creature to be at least seven feet tall. I knew it could be next to my vehicle within a minute. It would have ripped my locked door from my truck, extracted me from my vehicle, and there wouldn't have been a damn thing I could have done about it. Avalos was so shaken by the encounter that he has searched for the creature ever since. Well, I've been finding multiple tracks for a couple of years now, and they all seem to be from the same group, whether it's on the eastern side of the Sierras or whether it's on the western side of the Sierras, and I've been tracking them for over 400 miles. The Monster Quest team has found tracks that are similar to what Avalos has seen, and they follow them to their source. Fernando Moreira is a professional tracker. He was trained by the Portuguese Special Forces and fought wars in both Angola and Mozambique. If you're not real good and, and you make one little mistake, you can get your whole entire team killed or you, even yourself. Dr. Jeff Meldrum will test Moreira's tracking skills. We'll make it uh, simple here to begin with and then Maybe mix it up a bit. The varied terrain will make tracking difficult. I'll tell you this, that anyone who's faking bare footprints through this kind of environment would have to have spent more time out of shoe wear than I obviously have. That's about all I can do. Morera is called back and begins to read the overturned rocks and compacted soil with astounding precision. The good tracker should be able to follow the set of footprints all the way to the end of it. Morera is able to trace the route exactly, even identifying the spot where Meldrum briefly sat down to change his shoes. So this object actually sit down right here, whatever was, change shoes, okay, from the barefoot, put his shoes on it, and he's walking out. Even if a Sasquatch has the intelligence to try and conceal its tracks, Morera would still be able to track it. Well, I'm really, truly impressed, Fernando. I, uh, the fact that, that I was able to march out this uh, in your absence, and yet you were still able to pick up uh, all those details, even in the varied terrain. So you, you nailed the course really well. Clear for up. The team resumes the aerial surveillance. But strong winds make flying dangerous. Whoa. Okay, well, we're getting wind coming down off that ridge and kind of pushing us down. And that's why we're getting a few more bumps now. The original plan to fly into Lundy Lake Canyon is quickly changed. With this much turbulence, I'm leery of going in that canyon. Okay, let us know. The pilot attempts to fly towards the mountains, but the winds are too strong, and he is forced to retreat. I always have an out, even if there's a downdraft, we have an extra several thousand feet below us that we can just ride it out. We'll be landing in about uh, five minutes. Okay, check back in with us when we get there. The high winds mean that the ground team will be without air support. They're searching a location where Avalos found tracks in 2008. Hopefully we can find something down this way. Something here. This one right there, right? Right. So I'm gonna mark it all the way around here. Yeah. 
Let's go ahead and measure this. Okay, so this is looking like about a nine by four track. This isn't really what I've been picking up most of the time. The track appears to be a human print, so the team moves on. Meldrum and Mayanzinski begin to evaluate the surrounding habitat to determine if it could support a Sasquatch population. I'm going to be looking for meat sources. There's been a lot of reports of deer and elk being used as food by Sasquatch. Those are anecdotal stories, of course, but we have found some evidence that uh, they do use those things in some areas. But vegetation is more of a key to all of that because we don't find deer where there isn't deer food. Habitat's a combination of food and cover. This is really not prime habitat right where we're standing. They examine the food sources at a higher elevation, which might be more suitable for a large primate. Coming up from the lake, we're in a little better habitat here. We've got all these Jeffrey pines right here. This is probably one of the most productive sources of protein we can find. Right. Here's one that's dropping its seeds all over. The find makes Mayanzinski optimistic about the suitability of the habitat. These are a complete protein for humans. It's not outrageous to think that a large primate of that size can actually get most of its protein from these pines that grow right here. Other animals are known to follow the ripening of pine cones. At different elevations, you have a different time when these nuts become available. By knowing where these are and being able to plot these on vegetation zones on a map, we can, to some extent, predict where we should expect to find an omnivorous primate here. You find bears moving right to those places at exactly the right time within a day or so. Much like bears who teach their young to return to recurring food sources, a family of Sasquatch could be following this food trail. The young learn it from their mothers generally, in the case of bears, and often it has to be a quick movement right. because birds also feed on uh, pine nuts. Right. They also feed on the same berries that omnivores feed on. I think uh, we need to look at some other places to find a good combination of cover and uh, food sources. The large trout found in this lake could be another possible food source. And the team spots more bizarre marks in the sand. This looks interesting okay. here. And this one is actually a good footprint. You can see one, two, three, four, five. Five little yep. toes right there in this area. And there's a large footprint. This is another one. And look at right there too. You see yeah. where the hill is pointing? Pointing this way. Look away, the toe is pointing right there, and you have this disturbance here. And actually, even have the drag marks here, right? Yeah. So you know what these drag marks are? It's from a kayak or a sailing boat Coming that the person yeah. come out, out of the water. Here you can see that everything's already completely dry, and it's actually, these rocks is actually frozen in place. So this is about three days old footprint right there. Mons de Quest is investigating reports of a family of Sasquatch that have been seen in the Sierra Nevada mountains near the Nevada-California border. I didn't have a tag for this creature, wherever it was, so I wasn't about to shoot him. In 2005, Joe Walls was hunting for deer in a remote area. It's about 8.30 in the morning. As I went up on top of this ridge line, I started walking south on it. After traveling for about an hour and a half, I was pretty well tired. And I said, well, I'm going to sit down here and take a break for about a half an hour before I head back to camp. But Walls wasn't alone. At about 11.15, I said, well, I better get going again. It's getting late. I need to get back to camp. When I went and leaned over to grab my rifle, as soon as I touched that, I noticed moving behind this tree this creature walked out in front of me, and we had really good eye contact, and this creature had red eyes, but it had disappeared into the wood line. The beast rushed off with surprising speed, but then two others appeared. At that time, I noticed there was more moving to my left. I do think they're walking together as a family unit, 
me, these were definitely not uh, human beings dressed up in any type of costume. Uh, it was hunting season. Um, they would definitely be taking their lives in their hands, walking around with uh, monkey suits on in the mountains. The two creatures then disappeared in the same direction as the first. I started getting kind of nervous, and I started getting that feeling like, maybe I better get out of this area and get back to camp. When I walk in the woods now, I'm looking around me all the time. I'm very wary of my surroundings now, probably where I never was before. This video was shot at Mono Lake, not far from where other sightings were reported. The Stutchman Forensics Lab in Napa Valley, California, is analyzing the footage. So this is the copy of the original video that I received from the eyewitness. The science team is attempting to sharpen and enhance the video image, looking for details that might reveal the creature's identity. The low quality of the video is presenting a problem. We use a dedicated forensic software system um, that is typically used in my field for video enhancement. In this case, it doesn't help us very much because we're dealing with a limited number of pixels and resolution. The information is not there from the beginning, so if you don't have it in the original format, you're not going to be able to create it when zooming in or, or sharpening. They stabilize the image so that only the creature is moving. This is the stabilized movie. So you can see the subject moving from right to left, right here. The background is stabilized, and the camera view is moving around. Only one step remains. This is the final product, the stabilized image that's been cropped, so your eye can focus on just what's happening here and not any other distractions. From my portion of the video analysis, I can't tell 100% if that's a human or if it's a Sasquatch. But the image stabilization has already solved one mystery. This is what caught my eye in the beginning, is this kind of a foot or something right here. And some people think that there's a sleeve. In the stabilized view, you can see that there's a rock or a bush or something in the foreground that blocks the view of that. It appears the figure is not simply a man in disguise. The work is given to senior analyst Greg Stutchman. Greg will be able to use still photos captured from this video to calculate the height of the subject based on known dimensions at the scene. The expedition team is looking for groups of tracks. Dr. Jeff Meldrum is leading the hunt in an area near Lundy Lake Canyon, away from the usual recreation areas. We're well done on the fire, John. So I think it's uh, time for us to go ahead and try that solo camera system that I'm going to take with me mm -hmm. and head up into the ca canyon. Um, you guys will be able to uh, monitor my progress as we move along. Jaime Avalos will try to make contact with the creatures alone. But before he sets off, he masks his scent with smoke. The cameras he will use include a Buckeye wireless system that records night vision images from two perspectives and transmits live video. Yeah, I think we're set to go. Jaime, why don't you go ahead and take off? I think we're ready to send. OK, I'm heading out. Good luck. Avalo sets off into the darkness. Meldrum will monitor his progress. Six bars, got a good signal. So Jaime, how far do you think you are from base camp now? Copy that. He continues on up the canyon, attempting to elicit a response from the creatures. I'm gonna start here and uh, do a little whistling. Copy that. Avalos heads deeper into the wilderness. I'm really getting into a really dark area. I don't know if I'm getting that weird feeling or getting that. Just give me a minute on that one. He continues his journey not far from the location where he's seen the creature. I think I'm here along the lake right now. Looks like your signal's diminished to about 50% at this point. Still recording your uh, transmission, however. 
Avlos is nearing the limits of his video and radio transmitters. 30%. You're down to 30%. Are you hearing any responses in reaction to your whistling? I'm starting to hear something. It sounds like a baby cat. I'm picking up a little bit of noise to the left of me. I'm pointing the camera in that direction. Your signal's breaking up. We're getting basically just static at this point. Can you repeat your last? You're really breaking up. I think we've lost the signal. Oh, this is pretty weird here. Avalos' signal is gone. Hi, Amy. Do you read me? Monster Quest is searching for a group of Sasquatch that witnesses have encountered in the Sierra Nevada mountains. This man has been collecting evidence that he believes proves the beast's existence. This video analyst is examining evidence to identify the monster. And this man came face to face with three of the creatures while hunting in the mountains. The expedition team is conducting a search of the area and has heard strange cries. During the night, they have lost contact with a team member who was scouting a location said to be inhabited by Sasquatch. Try to call him again. Hi, me. Do you read me over? Finally, Avalos emerges over a nearby hill. He searched the area, but was unable to find what was making the sounds. The strange cry was not picked up by the team's recording devices so they cannot analyze or identify what Avalos heard. The team regroups in the morning to examine the prints they cast by the lake and to compare them to tracks Avalos has found in the past. They focus on three specific size groups. All right, this is it. This is it. So. What I have here are representatives of the 11, the 10, and the 8 on the west side of the Sierras as well as the east side of the Sierras. So go ahead and take a look and you can flip them over and you'll see time, date, and elevations of each of these as well as sizes. And those seem to be fairly consistent over the past two and a half years? Yeah, pretty much I always seem to find all three of the same. The repetition of these three distinct tracks has led Avalos to believe he has been following the same group of Sasquatch for more than two years. Well, there's no question in my mind that you're finding the footprints repeatedly of just a small selection of individuals. They determine the cast taken on this trip is a match to prior tracks. If we look at the details carefully, there are a lot of similarities. Um, this uh, rather distinctive furrow, the toe uh, configuration actually matches up quite well. Mayanzinski remains skeptical that any of them are from a Sasquatch. All these tracks seem to me to fit into uh, proportionally into a human description. What leads you to believe that these are something other than human? Well, it's just the fact of where I'm finding them that are much more remote, maybe three hours in, maybe about a 2,000 foot elevation gain into some of these back areas. Have you found some in climates where people wouldn't normally be walking barefoot? Yeah, actually it was this one here. This was taken in 3 December, it was along a lake. There was some snow along the side and it was a chilly day that day. I've also found them along areas where they've stepped on burrs and sharp rocks. Meldrum compares Avalos's smaller casts with some from his own collection that are thought to be adult Sasquatch tracks. So let me show you some examples of uh, what we would say are typical Sasquatch tracks. The first thing that, that is impressive is the size. And so the average Sasquatch track would measure uh, around 16 inches. Relatively flat foot and, and an exceptionally broad heel. We mentioned the, the flatness and that indicates that there's a lack of a longitudinal arch. These tracks uh, do exhibit an arch. This one is an excellent example, a very well-developed and well-expressed arch. While the arch is a hallmark of a human track, 
it does not rule out other possibilities. Meldrum has studied more than 200 track casts, but he's seen few that are small enough to be those of juveniles. That has raised the question of what would a juvenile Sasquatch uh, track look like? Uh, could it have a more human appearance and only take on these characteristics of an adult Sasquatch as they achieve their gigantic proportions? Professional tracker Fernando Morera has also examined the evidence, but can't say for sure if they are something other than human. I don't have enough evidence to turn on. We said if it was real or not real. He would need more than these isolated prints to make a final determination. A good track can always have to have a open mind and everything. Could be real, possibility. Could be fake, maybe. We don't know until we find enough evidence. I hope later along in the future that to be able to find something and be able to follow all the way to the end. If I could follow all the way to the end of it, I should be able to figure out the mystery. The analysis of the video evidence is complete. By overlaying the original video and still photos taken at Mono Lake, the horizon and rock formations are a perfect match. We've got the spot, we've got the location. We use photogrammetry to calculate heights of anything based on object of known dimension within a scene. Unfortunately, Weathering of the Tufa Formation has made the Mono Lake measurements difficult to use. Based on the comparison of the video and what's currently there, I prepared another exhibit. The lines show approximately where the water line is today. The creature is below the water level, which would mean less than, than seven feet. The seven-foot rise in the water level would be roughly one foot above the creature's head. So the conclusion is the creature is maybe six to eight feet. And that's about as close as we can calculate given the data we've got to work with. Monster Quest has made some exciting discoveries during this investigation. The expedition team determined that the area where the Sasquatch has been sighted could support a group of large primates. Deer, fish, and high protein vegetation would be sufficient to support a large primate even during the winter months. While they were not able to determine what it was, the science team has concluded that the creature captured in the Mono Lake video is between six and eight feet tall. And the team was able to locate one track that matches those Jaime Avalos documented in the area. And what I saw that day did not match my understanding of what a human looks like. And I really don't think they want any um, interaction with human beings. If they do, they'll let you know. These kinds of observations, in reality, lend greater credibility. This isn't just a, uh, a singular monster out there in the wild. We don't know it all, and there are still mysteries out there. And I think that's what keeps a lot of people going in this world, is to go out there and find out what's behind that next hill. <laughs>